there are disclosures, and um, which I have to always put up there. And um, so, oh, there it is. So um, my lab's at, at a cancer center, um, but I come from uh, a, an engineering uh, background, and it's been uh, exciting to be in that space. Uh, my lab certainly develops technologies, uh, like many of yours, uh, mostly uh, di uh, drug delivery systems and sensors. But um, being surrounded by people with questions and problems, basically, in a cancer center, so surrounded by, you know, almost purely biologists and clinicians, it, um, I've been very fortunate to be able to use these as tools not to, uh, and, and to be able to ask um, questions um, and, and answer questions, uh, uh, both on the engineering side, can we cure and diagnose cancer, but also can we, um, you know, can we answer questions about, say, why did it work, or, you know, or, or some, or basic biology questions. And so one challenge for me, of course, is w w from an engineering background to go into a place full of biologists speaking a new language. Uh, it took a long time to go to go a lot of seminars to eventually figure out what all those letters mean, but, um, uh, and, and acronyms, but it's been a really interesting challenge to try to <coughs> figure out, you know, um, in a context where the people would, would ask me questions about, um, you know, they, I show them all my technologies and they say, w w what's your question? And I say, oh, they, I don't have questions, I'm just making answers. And they, they, they don't like that. Um, and they, or they say, you know, but what, what problem are you working on? I don't have problems, I only have solutions. Um, they really don't like that either. So being in this, you know, biomedical context, I, I was challenged to figure out, you know, to, re to realize, eventually I realized, well, I'm making tools. And yes, those are tools to try to, treat diseases and, and diagnose diseases, but then it turned out that once I had that technology, once I was able to show it, you know, cured a mouse of cancer, then I had a tool that I could use to answer questions in biology. And so it, it was challenged me to kind of take that technology that I was building and, 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 and go further with it. Um, and so one engineering question we have, which I think is, I was in the session yesterday and I saw a lot of uh, excellent work on the question of can we improve drug delivery across the blood brain barrier? So that's the engineering question. Um, and we had been working on nanoparticles um, uh, for, for quite a while to try to get across blood vessel tumor barriers. And, uh, so, and I was in a, a pediatrics meeting at, at my cancer center and this pediatric neurologist asked, you know, can you get a get across the blood-brain barrier with your particle. And I'm like, well, uh, nanoparticles are hard it's, it's for blood-brain barrier, probably not. Um, but he had something, a, an interesting tool himself. He had a, uh, a genetic module, a, a model of medulloblastoma, um, and this is sonic hedgehog-driven medulloblastoma, that's the SHH, which comes from the video game name. And, um, and sonic hedgehog-driven medulloblastoma is exciting, um, a, a tool for, for looking at the blood-brain barrier um, because it has an intact blood-brain barrier. So, uh, and even not all versions of, of medulloblastoma, but sonic hedgehog-driven medulloblastoma has an intact blood-brain barrier. You see that the, the, in, even in this model of uh, M, the WINT-driven ver version, you, stuff can get out, it can extravasate, get outside the blood-brain barrier, but in the sonic hedgehog-driven version, it's uh, intact blood vessels. So we thought that's an excel excellent tool. If we actually had something that get it, that's across the blood-brain barrier, we could, we could uh, test that out really well. So um, the other issue about sonic hedgehog-driven medulloblastoma, the clinical issues, are, um, are so it's, uh, it's driven by the by activation, uh, sonic hedgehog activation of uh, a patch gene that turns on, that, else, that, that activates smoothened, and there's even drugs that uh, can be used to inhibit this pathway and inhibit smoothened, which is in that sonic hedgehog pathway, and, and stop the disease, uh, or at least slow it down for some time. The problem is that, that this, these drugs, and this is an approved drug, vismotigib, uh, it um, causes irreversible growth plate fusions in children, and medulloblastoma is a pediatric brain cancer, so if you can't give it to children, you really can't give it to uh, uh, anybody who has this disease. And what, what, this, uh, what this inhibitor does is it has an on-target toxicity. It works, the one, the, it works against this pathway, but this pathway is in growth plates, and, it, and if you give this to kids, uh, it causes dwarfism. It stops their bones from growing permanently. So you can't give it to kids, at least at the, way, at the doses you need, 
to deliver it, to, to give it, that any can get across the blood-brain barrier. In this case, some of this drug can get across the blood-brain barrier, but not enough that, you, that when you give the drug and in, the, in the rest of the body, it's at a much higher dose than it could be tolerated for um, bone growth. So we looked at this, um, at, at how, to, how to deliver, uh, we've been looking at, at, at delivering to, to the tumor endothelium. So can we, one other engineering question, it's been, can we deliver drugs across the, the, the tumors by targeting the tumor endothelium? And so, and, and maybe, in, in, and not just get to the tumor endothelium and kill it or something, but really get a drug across that barrier. And so we've been working on a, on a, a similar, um, some similar biology as, uh, as Ronit talked about, which has been uh, the, the P-selectin uh, and, and it's basically the molecules that uh, appear at blood vessels when they're activated. When a, a blood vessel gets a wound or, in an inf uh, or gets inflammation in, in, the, in the vicinity, it turns on um, a bunch of molecules that appear at the surface of the blood vessel, in, in the lumen of the, of the blood vessel. So, and what that does is it causes uh, uh, white blood cells to start attaching, rolling on the, on the side of the, of the, of the uh, blood vessel. So the body is... So, uh, have, has addressed the problem of how do you get something to stop at the right part of the, bl of the blood vessel to get something out of the blood vessel. So it solved that problem with things much bigger than nanoparticles. So we thought, well, can we just hack that biology and, and get something that will work kind of like these like blood cells and, uh, and, and get across in the site of inflammation or disease? Um, and, that's, uh, and so what happens is P-selectin shows up on the, on the blood vessel and our particles that bind to P-selectin um, can, can bind and hopefully get across. And so, the, the, in this case, the white blood cells have a ligand called PSGL1, which is a, and both, both PSGL1 and P-selectin are glycoproteins, so they have sugars on them that resemble actually the sugar on, uh, uh, on this, this uh, on the seaweed. Oh, okay, there it is. The seaweed, uh, and this, the sugar that's extracted from it is called fucoidin, which has a lot of uh, sulfates and, and, and fucose. And so, what we did is, is kind of made a particle out of this seaweed, uh, at, or at least it's got you know, a nice coating on the surface, and, uh, and we can, uh, and it has uh, this structural similarity to, these, uh, to this polysaccharide. Uh, something I, I skipped is that, we could, that, is that well, there's P-selectin in the tumor, and so P-selectin, turns out, can show up in many tumors because there's inflammation in many tumors, and that inflammation can turn on P-selectin on the blood vessels, because basically a tumor, as you may have heard, is a, is like, works like a wound that can't, can't heal. And so there's chronic inflammation in many tumors. But many tumors don't have that much inflammation, and certainly uh, even some of the ones that I listed here where we stain for P-selectin, a lot of the, the subtypes don't have that much inflammation. And so what we also get to use is the fact that you can, you can cause inflammation in a tumor with, type of, with certain types of tumor treatment, and one of them is radiotherapy. If you, uh, it was found over 20 years ago that if you irradiate a tumor, you can turn on inflammation, you, and that can turn on, and, and you turn it on uh, blood vessel activation, and you can get P-selectin to show up in a tumor that didn't have any before. So we we're excited about that. And so we made our particles, and basically it's a nano-aggregate where we, a hydrophobic drug can kind of form into this aggregate where we, we have a, a basically just our, our polysaccharide or an end, uh, end endocyanin, uh, an endocyanin dye, which actually acts like a, an excipient and stabilizes this nanoaggregate. So it's not actually, a, it's a non-covalently made, very simple particle. We really, sometimes we just call it a nano formulation. We also can make, uh, make it with dextran sulfate, another sulfated polymer that doesn't bind P-selectin as a control. And we talked about, uh, on a, as an aside, we've done a bunch of chemistry to figure out how these things form and their driving forces and use um, um, some uh, data analytics and machine learning uh, studies to figure out you know, which drug structures can form these particles. Um, but I'm not going to go into that now. Um, stick on the biology for the, for the moment. So we can make particles out of many uh, small molecule drugs with these. And, um, and we, uh, we found that if you... Uh, if, if you turn on blood vessel, uh, activate blood vessels, or these are endothelial cells just on a surface, with either cytokines like TNF-alpha or radiation, they, they, they start taking up uh, these nanoparticles faster. Um, now, that's not telling you whether they get across at the moment uh, to the other side, to the tumor side, but at least they get taken up. Um, and so when we made a particle out of this drug, Vismotigib, which was the uh, sonic hedgehog pathway inhibitor, um, 
we started uh, interrogating uh, uh, mice, these, this, this sonic hedgehog-driven medulloblastoma model. And so we had this, uh, this genetic model. And, and in this case, the, 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 the tumor is only in the hindbrain, because medulloblastoma is actually not necessarily that much in the medulla, it's in the cerebellum, so a little misnomer. And so if we give this uh, uh, particle to a wild-type mouse, um, you just see really the blood vessels from this, uh, light up from this uh, dye that's in the particles. If we give it to a sonic hedgehog mouse, so all the tumor is only back here in the, in the hindbrain, as I said, but you don't irradiate, you see a little bit of cloudiness, but not so much. But if you irradiate, even with quite low doses of, radi of radiation, you get these particles extravasating only in the tumor part of the brain and not uh, the forebrain, which has, has no tumor. And, um, and, if, and, and if, you, um, if we give our dextran sulfate particle that doesn't bind P-selectin, we, uh, we prevent that extravasation. So we have quite a nice uh, a system where we, and we've done even knockouts of P-selectin that show the same kind of thing, that, that P-selectin is causing this, this extravasation. And so just to show that it works, or you know, the, the, the working part of the you know, efficacy part, this is looking at a downstream effector of, of uh, sonic hedgehog, Li-1. We show that only with the, the green bar, with radiation plus uh, um, the, the particle, uh, Fucoidin bismotigib, five, 5 is, we get a lot of uh, inhibition of, of this effector. And if we give it to mice, uh, and it turns out that we, we gave these, these, these mice were about to die, all the mice that we, ga we gave drug to, they already had symptoms of of the disease, which basically you get only a three to four day window to treat them. And so all mice uh, pretty much die at the very, uh, very early on. Um, but if you, give them, uh, and if you give them radiation alone, the black curve, they, they, they survive some amount of time. If you give them um, radiation plus free drug, uh, which is the blue curve, it doesn't change anything. Only when you give radiation plus the particle uh, with, um, uh, that times P-selectin, you get a, a, a nice extended um, uh, benefit after that, and all everything was. We stopped treatment on day 16, so because our, our our my PhD student had to graduate, so we we stopped. We didn't want to go any lo longer than that. Um, and then, but how do, can we prevent the toxicity of that drug? Turns out the young mice will also respond to uh, this drug and uh, can cause dwarfism in the mouse. And so, if you give the amount of drug that would cause the eff amount of efficacy that we saw, um, you. Uh, you can, you'll shorten that mi the, the mice uh, considerably, um, and their bones as well. If you give the amount of drug that we gave with the particle, um, and, and in a particle, you, you can avoid that toxicity completely. But now this is the biological or question. Those are the clinical questions and the engineering questions. Why does it work? Why, does the particle really get the drug across the, the, the blood vessel? So we know that these, th these drugs aren't going to kill the endothelium, so we're not getting the drug just into the blood vessel, we're getting them all the way across the blood vessel in, a, in an attacked a a mouse with an attacked blood-brain barrier across uh, to the tumor side. And so when we started uh, staining these mice for different uh, targets, and I'm going to make a very long story very short, um, we started looking at m mechanisms, different mechanisms of, tr of transcytosis. And we looked at the caviolin uh, um, um, uh, method or caviolin, um, uh, caviolin uh, mediated transcytosis uh, mechanism. So caviolin can take up in an endocytosis mechanism, but it can also transcytose. And when we t when we uh, stain caviolin, it turns out that if you stain um, with if you just radiate these mouse mice, that doesn't turn on. But if you give the particles, uh, even if you don't uh, radiate the mouse, you can see caviolin light up. In these, uh, in these tissues. And so we did a lot of transwell assays and a lot of things, but the fun part is when the mouse geneticist says, yes, I can make you a knockout of caviol caviolin-1 in the brain tumor model. And when he did that, he, he showed that uh, we can find that when you give the particle to the, to the tumor mouse, you get the particle getting across the blood-brain barrier, but if you give it to this uh, mouse where we've knocked out caviolin-1, the, the, this, this structural protein that's, that's part of the cavioli, you see the particles just line up on the blood vessels but not get across. p selectin's still there, and so the particle can still bind to the blood vessel, but the cavioli mechanism is knocked out, so we can't get that, that particle doesn't extravasate and get across the blood-brain barrier. So we realize that we basically have some, uh, some crosstalk or some, uh, uh, some um, a, a mechanism here where particle or something that, that can bind to P-selectin binds, and that can 
uh, that, that can uh, trigger caviolin mediated transcytosis of material across uh, the blood-brain barrier. And so why is this true, or why, why, why could biology be doing this? Well, normally it's trying to bring um, uh, much bigger things, uh, uh, cells across, that, uh, across these barriers to treat infection. So there is a, a reason why it, it, could bring, it, it wants to bring something across the, the, these uh, endothelial cells. And so, and then we can use that to treat. And so, briefly on this part of the talk, to summarize, we have, we've been, you know, P-selectin is a target on, on leukocytes to, that enable extravasation uh, across activated blood vessels. We have this P-selectin, we, we discover this P-selectin caviolin axis that facilitates uh, transendothelial transport material across an intact uh, blood vessel, and this works below the, the, the neck as well as in the brain and to get across an intact blood-brain barrier. And so our next questions are, you know, now where can we use this? What kind of indications? And uh, can we translate to the clinic, this to the clinic? And we're, we're working with Ronit to answer some of these clinical questions because she's done some great clinical work in this, in this direction. Um, and so, but on the, on the biology side, th th these are the people. So, um, so ne our ne now I'm going to switch gears completely. So forget about everything I just said um, as I'm talking about the sensor stuff. Um, and so, the, the, so what, when we... Um, We've been thinking, we've been using, uh, my, my PhD work has been in carbon nanotubes. And so, and we never, never left that, that world, even though you know, in the cancer center, a lot of people you know, looked at me about at, at our carbon nanotubes and said, what are you, what are you doing with these things? Um, but we started one kind of uh, set of work on a clinical question, which is when you have a disease that has no good biomarkers, how do you detect that disease? Uh, at least, and can you get some sort of um, some sort of information from the blood if you don't know uh, what biomarker to look for. And so we started making sensors with our, with our nano, nano sensor technologies, but when we didn't have a biomarker that was a good marker of the disease, we couldn't say, well, can we detect it more sensitively? Because the problem was, okay, we detect this, we have a better and better sensor for a marker, but if that marker doesn't really tell us about what's really going on in the disease, we don't have a good sensor for cancer. And so this has been this, the sensor issue of, uh, in, in cancer is that it turns out you don't often need a more sensitive sensor. You just need to figure out what you're sent. You need a better target. And so we, we started working in our, um, uh, with carbon nanotubes in the, in the, in the space. We started in these, you know, looking at specific things, uh, specific markers. Uh, and the reason we've, we've, we use carbon nanotubes is that they're really good optical sensors. So it turns out that um, they're fluorescent, and not all of them, but the ones with a special, with, with a certain chirality of, of the carbons that uh, make them semiconducting. And so it turns out that these are fluorescent materials that don't photobleach. So we can shoot light at them all day, and we can get nice pictures of nanotubes floating around. We can cut them any length, so these are really long, but we can make them much shorter if we want. Um, and so, it, you know, even though a lot of the nanomaterials people have passed by carbon nanotubes into more exciting things for them, like graphene and other two-dimensional materials, we stuck with these one-dimensional things. We're stuck in a single dimension. Now, to make these things um, soluble, you have to wrap them in something, and so there's been many ways to wrap them in polymers and even DNA that stacks onto the nanotube, and we can watch these kind of movies all day and make them fluorescent, but what we really like is the fact that they have many, many mechanisms to modulate the fluorescence. They can, and the nice thing about a nanotube is that all, that all the electrons are on the surface, all the material of the nanotube is on the surface, so they're very accessible to the environment. So we can make a sensor with these things that will, that even though the nanotube doesn't is, is, doesn't photo bleach or doesn't, you know, kind of uh, quench by normal mechanisms, we can get it to, we, we, it's very sensitive to its local environment, and so we can get it to quench by, uh, by basically changing the redox environment, and we can get it to shift wavelengths by changing the hydrophobicity of the environment. So it turns out that the em emission is very sensitive. And then, in the recent few years, people have made defects on the carbon nanotubes that don't destroy the fluorescence, but <clears throat> and can enhance it, and you can get extra, um, uh, you can get sensitivities, uh, chemical sensitivities in, in many different ways. You can put many different groups on them, uh, on these nanotubes that you can change now. It's chemical sensitivity. So you have now a very diverse set of sensors that can sense many different things. 
And so, um, and, and OCCs are the name of the defects. Um, and then we can wrap them in different things that also can block or not block different things from sticking to them. So we have a way to make a diverse set of sensors that are sensitive to many things. The issue in the past has always been, can we just make them selective to one thing and make a good sensor out of it? And we thought, well, um, let's do that. So we started making sensors for many, kind of like a, a lot of analytical tools for fusion proteins, and we made them specific to certain inactivation mechanism of enzymes and, is, and implantable sensors to mi measure uh, microRNA, and, and then also sensors to measure um, hyperacidification uh, and lysosomes for, to measure autophagy, so we made an in vivo sensor for autophagy. And, these are, and so we're using these kind of as, as, as tools in biology and drug discovery, but what we really wanted to know is, can we make, use the fact that th they're a sensor for almost anything and figure out, um, can it detect disease? Just forget about the biomarker, just can it detect disease? Uh, and, or different, something different between disease and normal. Um, and so one big um, cancer in need of better methods of detection what is ovarian cancer, and, and the way I found that out is as I, I was in the lobby in, of, of Sloan Kettering's uh, uh, research center, and a gynecologic oncologist came to me and said, what do you do? And I said, I make sensors. And he said, great, we need new sensors for ovarian cancer because we can't detect them. And uh, the issue is that, that the five-year survival for ovarian cancer is really good if it's, if it's at stage one, if it's localized disease but only about 15% of people are detected at stage one, and many, many more people are detected when it's, uh, at, when it's already metastasized. And so we've got, and this, and, uh, and this has been a big problem with ovarian cancer, it's that it is very treatable, but very few people can be treated because they're, not, they're, they're, they're detected at late stage. So we said, well, there's lots of biomarkers of ovarian cancer, let's start making sensors for these markers. And then we realized, well, but there's not a good enough biomarker to actually give you an ability to detect it early. So instead of going to this one-on-one -on -one kind of recognition-based sensing of you have one marker and, one, uh, and, and, and you have disease, uh, or you have one marker and you, have, you can detect it with a sensor, we went after the idea of the perception-based uh, sensing. So it's the way your nose works. So your nose has olfactory receptors. It's about, it's, it's about 400, you have, have about 400 olfactory receptors in your nose or in your sinuses. And so you can, um, uh, you can use those 400 different receptors to detect not 400 different smells, but about a trillion different smells. And the way that works is that different receptors bind to different mo odor molecules in, in, in a pattern. And that pattern can be deciphered by your brain, and then you can, get a, uh, you, you can detect a certain scent, and you can drink wine and, 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 and smell differences that I probably can't smell. Um, because you, you're wenophiles, I'm sure. So, um, and then, but, and people have made kind of sensors that do this kind of same thing, different sensors with different binding affinities to different analytes, and you can um, get a pattern, and then now with machine learning and, and different analytical data uh, analytics methods, you can uh, pattern match and figure out what binds to what, and you can recognize something. And so, in this case, bacterial species. But in our case, we want to detect, we, we want to recognize disease. And so what we did was we just took a bunch of our different sensors, made a big array of different sensors of different um, sensitivities, and put them into a well plate, and then put blood from patients into that well plate. And what we looked at was changes of the fluorescent peaks of our nanotubes that respond to all these different things. And, um, and we usually took a large array of sensors and then kind of whittled down to see which ones were giving us diverse responses for, with different patients, and, with, and especially between disease and not disease. And we can get a big array of responses. We can train those uh, to say that these were the disease patients, these were the healthy patients, and then we have a fingerprint of basically a spectral fingerprint that we turn into a disease uh, re uh, response. And so we start with these defect uh, def nanotubes that we put these, these chemical defects on to change the chemistry, and then different wrappings, usually just different sequences of double-stranded DNA that stick onto the nanotube and make a different morphology of the surface of the nanotube. And then we get these, this is our raw data, these fluorescent peaks, one from the defect peak and one from the nanotube itself. And we get, we, we interrogate it with blood from patients. We, we actually took not just healthy people and 
We have people call them healthy patients, but they're not patients if they're healthy, I guess. And then we take disease, we take ovarian cancer, and then we even took people, because we were from, at a cancer center, we took people with other diseases, like breast cancers, and we took pa patients with other gynecologic um, uh, issues, malignancies and non-malignancies, and put them into the healthy group, actually, to say, can we really detect this, the high-grade serous ovarian cancer different from other things? And um, so far, we only took about 260, 280 pa uh, samples, um, and we got, we got a big set of responses where each column is a different patient and each uh, row is a different sensor and actually we're getting different responses from each of these different sensors. We have a big set of data and then we, uh, we couldn't make a, any sense of it by any normal analytical methods or now AI is normal, so other conventional or analytical methods. But when we start look, using different machine learning models like, uh, 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 like um, neural network and random forest before vector machine uh, algorithms, which now will get easier and easier to use, that a postdoc coming in from something else, some other field can come and learn this. And, um, and we started optimizing this with different, using, uh, you have to deal with a feature selection and, and which of our, which sensing responses can be uh, uh, most used in this method. But in the end, we get, uh, we got this. We actually got a, uh, a cross-validation score of uh, 94, 95%. We then took a new set of patients and then tested again, not so many patients, but enough to tell us that we weren't overfitting our model and we can get a very good response. And then um, when we looked at just um, the, the known, the, the classical, uh, or the, the most effective but classical markers for ovarian cancer, um, like CA125 and HE4, and they didn't do as well. And so this is a ROC curve, and so basically if it looks like a complete L shape, you've detected everything 100%. Um, but, uh, but, but the closer you get to this kind of diagonal, the worse it is. And so we can definitely do better than the known cancer biomarkers. <coughs> And so, great, we can detect cancer. Well, well, why does it work? And so, we, because we have the sensors for everything and we threw a bunch of stuff at a bunch of stuff and we got a black box of machine learning. And so now, <laughs> that was the hard part. Great, we detected cancer. Well, the hard part is getting it to the level of the clinical, uh, exactly uh, clinically effective, which needs to be still higher than this. But we also want to, but getting it there, in, get, in getting your te our technology to work better, we also want to know why it's working, and uh, so we know how to optimize it. And so when we, um, so we did a bunch of things. We titrated different biomarkers and the known cancer biomarkers onto our, using our specific, sen our, our diff different sensors. Um, that, we, that were part of this array of, of sensors. We in the, end up using only six sensors to, to do this. And some of them can actually respond to, say, C125, the best cancer biomarker for ovarian cancer. Um, but others didn't. And when we did what's called a feature importance analysis, these are the different sensors and the different responses of the sensors to figure out which ones were important in the detection. And it turns out that some of these sensors didn't respond to any known cancer biomarkers, but they were still important <coughs> in our detection. So it told us that there's known cancer biomarkers that were made this sensitive uh, to, to cancer, and that's why it worked some of the way, but there's other markers that we, could, that we didn't know what they were yet that, um, that were causing this to detect cancer. And so now the question is, what are those markers that are also detect being detected by the sensor that, that are part of this response uh, to cancer, but, um, we're not, but we don't know what they were? And so how are we going to figure that out? That's... Well, this thing was, the whole thing was published without, it, without us even answering that question. Now we have a lot of work to do, maybe the real work, uh, to figure out what was actually sticking to the sensor. Um, and the way we're trying to do that now, and this is on, in work in progress, is we're taking our, we're, we're looking at the protein corona, which I think some people here work on. And, um, and the protein cor corona, or the, 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 is basically when you have a nanoparticle in serum, um, and that we've been using all serum from patients to, that we took and put our sensor onto, uh, there's protein sticking to it. And there's a lot, whole field now of people trying to figure out what's sticking to these, uh, to, to these particles for various mechanism, me methods. Um, you often to figure out why your nanoparticle is getting to a tumor or not or a certain, uh, or a certain part of the body. But in our case, we just want to know what's sticking to these sensors so we can figure out what's actually the mechanism of response. So we're now in the do, doing with the... The, with doing a lot of mass spec, washing off these uh, sensors uh, uh, to figure out uh, what they're sti what's sticking to them and, what's, and ma maybe that would allow us to find a new biomarker of disease or at least to know the mechanism. If we're worried or maybe not worried, still worried, but 
we could probably get, end up finding that these are, are working because they're detecting 100 different proteins that are going up and down. And that wouldn't very, be a very good clinical, mar clinical marker. Uh, you can't go and say, oh, give me an antibody test for 100 proteins. But at least we know what's going on, and we'd probably still use our sensor. If we can find that one biomarker that, or five biomarkers that might be uh, causing this to work really uh, well, then it would be great to, make, to find what those are. So we either are discovering new biomarkers or discovering the mechanism of why the sensor is working, but we think either one is useful. Uh, and so we're going through this process of figuring out what's sticking to these sensors and, and hopefully we'll find something, but that's work in progress. And, uh, and what we found so far is that um, at least on this, when we wash off the sensors compared to the full serum, we get kind of low abundance proteins that are concentrated onto the sensors. So we think that our sensors are, are basically simplifying the sample of, of, of the many, many proteins in serum uh, that could be, that, 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 that's, uh, that, and so that could help us potentially find hopefully some needles in the haystack of proteins that might be sticking to the sensor. It's possible that the sensor is also detecting things like metabolites, and so we'll have to go through that if we, if we, if we need to. It's probably not detecting RNA or DNA sequences, because I can't see a way that that can be working when, there's something, when you're just dealing with a surface. Um, but we're, we're, we're getting there. And so, and then, because I mentioned the brain before, I just, I'll give you one tiny piece of data about the brain, is that now someone came to us and said, well, can you just tell us the difference between different brain cancers and a liquid biopsy? Not to tell, diagnose the brain cancer, but can you just tell, to, uh, identify them? And so we're not as good as ovarian cancer yet, but we've gotten, uh, we've, so far we've got a, a, the sensor detecting the difference between glioma and meningioma from peripheral blood taken from the vein. And so, we take, and, and so we can hopefully get something that at least that can help diagnosis um, and maybe stratify patients uh, uh, for, for something like a, a brain tumor. Um, and so that's, this, this is also ongoing, but we're excited about that. Um, and so we've got this liquid biopsy potential tool. Uh, it detects diseases and the absence of, of uh, known biomarkers. Um, and proteins, maybe metabolites, we'll see, are... Uh, that are either, either unknown or, uh, or not part of conventional screening protocols for ovarian cancer, we're likely responsible for the ovarian cancer detection. There's lots of benefits of this approach, like you can ask anything you want. Or how, how are these people different from these people based on their serum? Um, and uh, and we're, we're using this for both cancer and non-cancer conditions. Um, and, and, we, and you can do things like continual learning, where like you've, you've got your first set of patients, but now you want to keep asking, can we get this better and better, improve the algorithm? You can just keep adding patients to it. Kind of like you use a self-driving car, get more and more data by driving it around the country, and you can, get, you can hopefully prevent crashes. It works in a maybe similar, analogous way to that. Um, but mechanistic understanding is what we really want, and maybe this could be used for biomarker discovery. So limitations right now are, well, one, we need a ton of data for this. You need as many patients as you possibly can, which is hard for rare tumors, but also getting the ground truth of detection is still difficult, and that's where we're, we're, we're at at the moment. So those are how nanotubes are hopefully going to cure cancer. <clears throat> I want to address something because I'm in Europe uh, about why, and this is just uh, this is published uh, last year, and this is a great set of te a team, a cl very collaborative team to, uh, uh, that, that really brought us together, clinicians, lab medicine people, and the, and the basic nanotube scientists. Um, but uh, what I really want to talk about for just a few more minutes is <clears throat> the issue of, of the regulatory environment, not about treatment, but about carbon nanotubes, because I, I think some people in the audience might know from the last maybe 20 years ago that this has been a big issue about, you know, okay, Dan, you're using carbon nanotubes to cure cancer, but there's been the, all this issue about, well, carbon nanotubes cause cancer, right? And there's been issues, especially in Northern Europe, um, by this, uh, for instance, there's an NGO, non-governmental organization, that put carbon nanotubes on uh, what's called its SIN list, which is called Substitute It Now, to, um, which is basically a, saying this is a, a material of very high concern, you should substitute it out of any industrial process or product if you can, and um, uh, because it's, it's bad, um, and, um, and potentially to ban it in the EU. And uh, the non-governmental, uh, this uh, NGO is called ChemSec, which basically makes these li this list of materials we should be hopefully banning in the EU. And so we, uh, we looked at this in 2020, the paper came out in Nature Nanotechnology, well, just a, a, a commentary uh, where they, uh, they disclosed this. 
And uh, we said, well, that might be bad if um, we're doing things with carbon nanotubes that hopefully are good. And how do we come to a conclusion of this? Uh, and and what they also said was that carbon nanotubes basically are one CAS number, one chemical abstract service number, uh, which is maintained by the ACS, American uh, Chemical Society. And so there's one CAS number for carbon nanotubes. Let's just ban that CAS number. OK. Um, and uh, very, um, I would say, uh, European way of, of thinking, when there's a lack of data, we should, we should proceed with caution, as opposed to the American way, which is, you know, fire and forget. But uh, so, so they basically said, well, there's lack of data on nanotubes, I mean, but a lot of, a lot of things say they're bad, so let's ban them. Um, and then also a bunch of, of studies came out where they used carbon nanotubes. They caused asbestos-like behavior and mesothelioma, so they can potentially cure, uh, cause cancer, not cure cancer. Um, and um, they also don't degrade in natural environments. They're pretty persistent. Um, and they also said, uh, well, there's like a different mix of forms and catalysts potentially, and so that's dangerous. And so, well, we know that, um, and so basically they're, that, for that, those reasons, they, they added them to this list. And so, well, we know, well, we're using nanotubes in various ways to try to treat, can treat uh, to, to, to diagnose uh, cancer, and also they're used in uh, a lot of people in the plant field now or for, for delivery in lots of different ways and, and discovery. And also, the other nanotube people on the more kind of non-bio side are making these, uh, are actually trying to make these carbon negative, so uh, using these for environmental remediation and carbon capture, uh, uh, actually using them to replace um, really talks of things like cadmium and batteries and uh, making them to, uh, you know, kind of less energy intensive uh, materials uh, like, um, you know, lightweight, uh, strong materials. So we were, figure, we figured that there seemed to be a disconnect between the people and also you want these per to be persistent. You don't want your batteries to degrade so fast. So we thought there's a disconnect here. So they wrote their little commentary. We wrote a write, uh, with all the nanotube people, big, uh, all the nanotube groups who kind of wrote something back in Nature Nanotech, a commentary saying, that would be really bad to ban this material right now. Um, and then they wrote back and said, well, you're, you, don't, you, don't, you didn't understand. Uh, and so we thought we could keep going back and forth um, on Nature Nanotechnology commentaries, but we thought maybe let's come together with do something about this. So we had this idea of talking to policy um, uh, experts and developing some sort of evidence-based framework to, under, to try to figure out how to move towards better policies for materials like that, maybe for all nanomaterials, but at least you know, for the test case of carbon nanotubes. And so we first realized that, well, <clears throat> it's really bad to make your material that's very diverse into one cast number. So, because you can then, because people can say, well, let's, let's ban this whole cast number. Um, Problem is that they're very, very diverse. So the materials that were causing asbestos-like uh, uh, symptoms were multi-walled carbon nanotubes that were aggregated together to make basically nanotubes that were the same size and shape as asbestos, which actually is the reason why asbestos works the way it does, it's the size and shape. But single-wall nanotubes don't that, do that, and even lots of multi-walls don't. And then there's all these different defects and physical structures, and you can, you can purify them from the catalyst metal toxic particles or not. So there's ways to make these things basically toxic or not toxic in many ways, depending on, you know, exactly how you make these things, because they're just so diverse. They really deserve more than one cast number, and maybe every pr preparation of these things uh, can use a cast number. Um, and then the other thing is that most people, when they did coxicology work, and they're still doing coxicology work on these, use raw nanotubes, and they do pulmonary administration or, or go into cells or go into liver uh, or just IV, and that's one way to do toxicology, but there's many different ways. And the problem is that if you look at the life cycle of a product with carbon nanotubes, they're almost never, in a very small amount of time, they're in the form of raw, powdery nanotubes. They're in a product, or in a solution, or in something. And so you have to look at the whole life cycle and the waste management issues of exactly where are these things in the, when, when is there risk of exposure, um, and, when is, and, and when are they in the, and, and in which ways, uh, which form factors are they in the, in the environments. And so we realized people need to think about this aspect of carbon nanotubes. Um, and then on the, on the environmental side, it turns out that if you use nanotubes to remediate the environment, you probably have to ba basically think about the environmental effects, both the positive and negative, of, and the potential ones in the future of how carbon nanotubes might be used. So this is kind of just how, the way we're thinking about this and realize that you've got to think a little deeper than just say ban it all. Um, but, you know, you have to proceed with caution and not maybe do the 
American approach net either. Uh, there's got to be some middle ground, and that's what we've been going for. So briefly, let me finish up. Um, they tell you the conclusions. So basically, the issues with the, the carbon nanotubes are there's a lot of diversity, and they're not reflected in the taxonomy and the cast numbers. Um, the toxicology must be considered at all stages of the life cycle, and then environmental impacts have to be considered both in all stages of their life cycle of this material, but also both positive and negative impacts and potential impacts. And so this work was done by a bunch of people, including pol public policy expert at the Baker Institute of Public Policy at Rice University, who was published this past year uh, in Nature Review's uh, materials. If you want to see it, it's also, I think, on, uh, I think it's, it, it's, it's free to access that. And um, I'd like to thank all my, so many collaborators, funders, current and former uh, uh, lab members, uh, and you, and happy to take any questions at their time. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Um, we are 15 minutes late, so I will give time for two questions, and then we discuss in coffee break. There is one there. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. Uh, I have a question about uh, how you arrived at those six different nanotubes, because it seems to me that you can only really figure that out post hoc after you do the, the corona uh, Analysis. That's a great question. We're still trying to figure that out better. How do we get from a lot of, uh, of different diverse kind of nanotube sensors down to a few? R it's been completely empirically so far. It's been basically, we have maybe ideas of ones that might be good, and then we have others, and we throw all the patient samples at all the sensors, uh, as many as we can make and make sense with the amount of volume of blood we have, and then figure out which ones give good responses between disease and healthy and then whittle that down from there. And so, so far it's been empirically, we have lots of ideas, but no really great ones about how to get to the best set. Um, but, but if you get the same responses from two sensors, you only need one, so. Thanks. Okay, one more, there is one there. Hello, thank you for your talk. Uh, I have a question regarding the first part of the talk, so P-selectin. Um, I want to, I'm interested in the overexpression of P-selectin after radiation exposure. And I was curious about the time um, frame uh, between the uh, radiation and then the P-selectin overexpression, and if you found the time-based correlation. Yeah, that's a great question. We're still trying to, uh, to, to optimize that, uh, the, really know exactly when is best. But it's very immediate because this is not, uh, it's not just expression or, and, and, and production of the protein, but it's actually translocation of stored piece of lectin that's in these little uh, vesicles called Weibel-Plotty bodies in the cell that are translocated. So if there's a wound, you want these things to get to the surface real fast. So we've been able, we, can, we usually inject just a couple hours after we irradiate. And so it's been very quick. But the optimal time course, we're trying to still find that out. OK. And then are you, um, did you uh, understand whether the target can then um, separate from P-selecting after crossing the oh. endothelial layer and navigate the environment? So like, how does the drug get out of the particle? So the, the particle is really not, we didn't make it to be very stable. And so it's not conjugated. So it's basically, it's, a narrow, it's an aggregate. Um, some of it is falling apart over time, just gradually. Um, the half-life in the serum is really only maybe five to 10 hours. Uh, so it will fall apart. By the time it gets into the, when it gets on the other side of the blood vessel, it gets endocytosed and it's going to be eaten up by lysosomes. The, the, the part of the, 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 the uh, drug in it can cross bar uh, membranes pretty easily. So, um, uh, so it basically just falls apart in the, in the cell, in the endosome and, it's, and releases. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I mean, let's go for coffee break and we can catch up with the speakers. Again, thank you, um, thank you. Daniel, and also to Francesco.